Welcome everyone to Who's Who in Aviation and Weather, a program where I speak with some of the most influential and prominent people in the aviation and weather industries. This is your host, Dr. Scott Denstead. Well, I'm thrilled to have Rod Machado on the program with me. Hey, Rod, thanks for sharing the time and experience with us. Scott, thank you so much for having me on your show. It's a, it's a real honor to be here, and uh, you've been such a prominent voice for aviation weather safety uh, in this business for such a long time. And now I get a chance to talk with you uh, in person, direct, and that's uh, quite an honor. Uh, quite quite frankly, if we ever try this at Oshkosh or Sun and Fun or something like that, it would never happen. Yeah, that's true. Uh, even in lunch, you know, we, there's so many pilots that uh, want to talk and chit chat. So, you, you know, it's uh, hard to have an individual conversation, but uh, this makes it so much uh, easier and so much more fun. That's right. The benefits of technology for sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so I see you made it through the daylight saving time switch over here. Uh, indeed, I did. That's right. And still suffering for that loss of one hour. Right. So, so, um, so, so how's the weather there? Uh, surprisingly, it's bad. Hmm. Uh, now that that's just a local marine phenomena here, but uh, there was no rain forecast. At least when I looked at the app, there were no blue dots uh, for the hour on the app. And I, what the weather people do out here is they're not as sophisticated as you. Uh, they wait till it starts raining and then they put, oh. put the blue dots on the app. They got a guy that does that, specifically <laughs> the blue dot guy. And, right. uh, but, uh, so we're getting a little rain here. It's a little cool, but you know, California is mostly pretty nice weather. Yeah, it is. My daughter lives in LA. So, uh, we go out there a fair amount. Um, and you know, we see the Marine layer happen all the time. So I just wanted to get a little bit of weather information since this is a weather and aviation, uh, discussion here. But, uh, so, uh, you know, if you don't know Rod, um, you've probably been living in a dark, dark cave for many, many decades. So. For those that do know Rod, uh, he's an aviation author. He's got several books, as well as hundreds and hundreds of articles he's written over the years. And if you've been lucky enough to hear him speak, you know that Rod uses humor as the way to teach pilots valuable lessons that they remember. Yeah, well, thank you, Scott. You're, you're very kind. Interesting about the humor thing, you know, back in the 1970s when I started teaching ground school, um, you know, I'm, I'm a young guy, 22, teaching students in an accelerated type of ground school. And I realized that um, getting people to pay attention to you, even though you're the flight instructor in a classroom at accelerated ground training, where I started training ground school, um, you, you, you had to get their attention. And I, I realized that there are a couple of ways to get people's attention. You can make them cry, you know, tell them a very sad story, right. or you can make them laugh. Now, if you can make them laugh, you have the ultimate behavior modification tool. And by that, I mean, uh, you tell them a relevant joke or uh, insert a relevant bit of humor, all of a sudden they're focused on you. And then mm -hmm. you uh, parlay that attention into the connection of a very important point. And so uh, this is very strange. Back in 1975, I spent probably the uh, 10 years from 1975 to 1985, even beyond that, going to different comedy clubs. And mm -hmm. I would take my uh, notebook uh, and go in and I would study the comedians. And that includes Jerry Seinfeld when he first started, uh, Jay Leno. Um, and, and all the other folks that you could think of that actually are starting to retire from comedy today. But uh, I developed some very important uh, principles that allowed me then to take and generate humor in a way that uh, was relevant to the class I'm teaching. So it gave me a very useful edge at being able to do that when I taught ground school or, and when I taught college. In fact, I had one college professor uh, call me after he monitored my aviation weather class, and he said, you know, you've got to stop uh, using humor in the class. And I said, well, pray tell, sir, why is that? And he said, because they're going to come to expect it. Right. And I, I thought to myself, you know, not wanting to show disrespect to the dean, but I said yeah, to myself, yeah, imagine that. They'll want to show up for class next time instead of not wanting to show up. So anyway, that uh, it became a very useful tool for me. Well, for sure. I mean, I remember when I was uh, first starting to learn to fly back in the mid nineties, 
uh, joined AOPA like probably a lot of other pilots did and got my AOPA pilot mm -hmm. magazine. And the very first thing I would do is flip to the article you wrote for that particular issue. Oh, you are so kind. Yeah, I mean, it was because I knew that I could get a very honest and open and very directed uh, lesson from you for that particular thing. So I could I guarantee that when I close that magazine up, uh, that I walked away with something useful. And and like I said, it was every single issue. You were the first one that I paid attention to. You were so, I knew somebody was doing the flipping. Uh, I wasn't sure who it was. And now I found the guy. Right. Oh, you're, you're very kind. One of the interesting things about writing that I learned too, um, was that uh, every, you have to get people's attention. It's a, the ultimate behavior modification tool. Almost every article I've ever written uh, always starts out with a joke or an anecdote, uh, something to get people's attention. And it's as if that's a great mystery. <laughs> it's never a great mystery. It's just a very simple thing. It's what, you know, people do if you want to get their attention. So, yeah, thank you, though. Interesting, interesting. And, and so when you were, you know, just starting to learn to fly, what attracted you to aviation and and wanting to learn to fly. What was it in your family history? Did you have some relative or did you just like aviation? Oh, it, it wasn't in my family history. None of my family flew. They flew the coop, but uh, they didn't uh, They didn't fly airplanes. And uh, the, um, uh, I, I, Scott, I can only attribute that to one thing. And that's this Jungian answer. It's a Jungian archetype uh, in as much as there might be one for aviation. And that is, it's just built into my my system hmm. as it's built into the system of what I've calculated to be based on uh, my anecdotal questioning of people about why you got into aviation 95% plus say I always wanted to fly and I, I don't know any more important testimony uh, that one would need to know that hey there's something deeper going on uh, embedded in our genetic code or some uh, ethereal connections that uh, people who want to fly, they're just attracted to flying. As a matter of fact, when Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, came out with Microsoft Flight Simulator, I think it's 2004, the very first upward edition of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, uh, it, actually, excuse me, that's Microsoft Flight Simulator X that came out 2010, something like that. They sold 3 million copies, 3 million copies. I, I mean, if, they, if, if that doesn't uh, testify to the enthusiasm for aviation i i don't know what does <clears throat> so uh, that that's it i just always wanted to fly and managed to find a way to do that when i was 16 by uh permanently uh bugging the lady who ran amelia reed aviation amelia reed and i just called her for two weeks almost every day straight and, <laughs> and she kept saying no job boom no job boom and then one day she called me and she said um, would you happen to have some time to come down? And of course I dropped the phone and about 10 minutes later, I was at the airport oh. and I got a job pumping gas and it just all went on from there. And so that's, that's pretty much how I got started. Sure. And by the way, just as an aside, only 5% of the people, um, typically pursue aviation from a utilitarian point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that maybe they didn't want to fly, but their primary objective was to use the airplane for some business uh, or some uh, um, um, other activity that uh, is outside this basic desire to learn to fly. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, I mean, I didn't have a background in terms of my, my parents or brother or sister or any you know, grandfather that was a, a pilot by any stretch of imagination, but I lived two miles from a you know, large airport, so it was mm -hmm. planes fly with all, all, you know, every single you know, day, and, and I used to go out to the viewing park where I could watch the jets come flying in, and so I just said one day I would love to be able to do that, and my interest in weather and meteorology really you know, kind of meshed really well together to learn that aspect of it and you know i i wanted to, you know all all the you know all the guys in my high school wanted to be uh, you know astronauts during that time i wanted to be a hurricane hunter i wanted to be the guy that flies into hurricanes so uh, I, I never got it. to that point i never got through that uh, uh process but you know my interest doesn't you know come from any kind of family oriented you know i didn't grow up in an airplane so to speak 
Uh, and I didn't get my pilot certificate until I was well into my early 40s. So, um, so from that standpoint, um, I, I just, that was my kind of how I ended up there. Um, and do you remember your first flight that you took? Oh, yes, absolutely. I remember it very clearly. It's, uh, you, you know, uh, how can I forget the flight instructor yelling, let go of the controls, don't touch them again, <laughs> take your hands off that. Uh, but th no, that, that didn't happen. Um, but no, I remember it very, very clearly. I remember, I remember circling in, in this uh, Taylor craft, circling around, looking down, and I, I'm, I can still see the cows. They're probably around seven or eight cows I was looking at on the ground. I couldn't, I, I, it's, just, it's an image that stuck in my mind. And those, you know, very uh, basic experiences, uh, I, you know, I, I can still reconnect with and that continuously provides a, a source of, uh, of pleasure. But, uh, you know, aviation made a, a great change in my life too, because up until that time, I was on the verge of recalcitrance, didn't do very well in school. And all of a sudden, um, aviation gave me an opportunity to, to experience uh, a, a form of success that quite frankly, uh, I, I don't think a lot of young people experience. And at that time I was 16 years old and all of a sudden it made me realize, wow, I have tremendous control over my mm. environment. I can learn almost anything. And it, it, it was, it was very transformative. As a matter of fact, it's interesting because from the psycholo uh, psychologist's point of view, you can, if, if you want to change the direction of a young person's uh, 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 life, what you want to do is give them something that allows them to bring something to the something to the table from a, a social perspective. In other words, uh, when a young person relates to older people, typically they have nothing to relate to, you know, except, hey, I play marbles or I shot a bird with a BB gun or whatever the case may be. You don't want to shoot birds with a BB gun, of course. But th the point is that uh, they don't have anything to bring to the table. But David Copperfield said, if you want to give a, a young person something to bring to the table, you teach him magic. Uh, or, Rob Machado says, teach him how to fly, because it's very transformative. Or, um, teach him martial arts. Teach a person martial arts, uh, magic, or how to fly. All give somebody something, a young person, something that they can use uh, as a conversational opener. Uh, it's a conversational gambit uh, that gets older folks to pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And once a young person can do that, now they have a connection with an older person and an opportunity and an avenue for uh, acquisition of wisdom. It's, it's powerful, powerful stuff. Yeah, it is really powerful. I mean, from my perspective, it, I was in a situation where I wanted a new challenge in life. And at that time, I was either thinking about going to get my PhD back uh, in the 90s or I've always wanted to fly, so to me it set, you know, I had to set goals, so I had to, I saw a, a really different future, and I never really intended to ever make this my business, because I was a software engineer and worked as a meteorologist as well, and then so my, my focus there at that point was, hey, just, uh, you know, let me just use this as a hobby, but then eventually I started realizing mm -hmm. as I started learning more about what pilots need to know about weather, I thought, well, I could marry those two up, that my love of weather and my newfound love for aviation, marry those two up and make a business out of it. You know, I don't make any money out of it, but you know, I'm, I'm enjoying life. I wake up every day with new challenges. Yes, yes. Well, that, that is a, a great success story um, to, uh, first of all, the, uh, the fact that you discovered something at a later point uh, in, in your life that uh, gave you great pleasure flying an airplane and then be able to connect that with uh, your other uh, in intellectual pursuits, uh, that, that, that is, is, is truly phenomenal. But uh, it's, it's clear that what that did was generate a, a great deal of passion. And you said, I look forward to getting up and going to work in the morning. Um, and it, 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 that shows in the products you've created. Now, I've seen your log, uh, uh, SKU T log P mm -hmm. course that uh, is available at pilot workshops, yes. and it, it's 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 phenomenal. And first of all, uh, SKU T log P, uh, that the word in itself is enough to you know <laughs> not both uh, anybody's lobes out of their socket so mm -hmm. that they right. they become uh, numb in the brain. But the fact is that uh, SKU T log P is a very important um, meteorological 
analysis that people have in your 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 mm -hmm. courses is, is is great. But you also have two apps too. Mm -hmm. You have Easy Weather Brief. This is an app, and Easy Weather Departure Advisor. And we had talked about this just a little bit before we started. And uh, but and what I absolutely love about that is that this makes a connection with the people that are using it and and instead of just saying go or no go you're giving people options mm -hmm. uh, as to whether they can go uh whether they can go here go this far and if they can't go where they want to go let's say uh then maybe they can go this way or or that way and i'm speaking in very broad terms here but i think what it shows is that you have a deeper understanding of, of what people need mm -hmm. as well as what they want uh, and I honestly don't see that in anybody else's weather product. And uh, and I, I'm not just kissing up to you because normally I save the kissing up to the very end of the program. Uh, right. But, but uh, anyway, so kudos to you. I think you, uh, you've you made a great contribution to general aviation that way and hopefully save a lot of lives in the process. Yeah. Hopefully that's the case. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so when you, when you look at your the over the years, what do you see as being some of the most important things that have come about in the recent decade or two uh, in the cockpit? What things have really changed the way pilots fly? That's a, that's a great question. It's one that I always enjoy talking about. First of all, I, over the years flying, the actual act of flying an airplane hasn't changed. It's ha hasn't gotten more complex. It hasn't gotten less complex. It's pretty much the same, which explains why Part 141 uh, still allows a person uh, to obtain a private pilot license with 35 hours of flying time, and uh, or Part 61, 40 hours of flying time, despite the, the amount of uh, flight training and solo time required uh, therein. Uh, th those have varied over the years, but you know, back in 19, uh, the 19th, late 1930s, 1940s, uh, the CAA, Civilian uh, Aeronautics Association uh, had a requirement for the private pilot license for 25 hours of flying time. And uh, that that changed up in the mid 1950s, that changed to uh, what it is today, 40 hours. So that hasn't changed. Uh, what has changed, of course, is now the uh, the, the complex, the, the comprehensive nature of flying. Uh, what doesn't deal with the actual act of flying the airplane, uh, the comprehensive nature deals with all the things that are involved in the uh, sphere of flying. And we're talking about understanding airspace, which is uh, now a, m much more complex than it was in the 1940s and 1950s, much more uh, uh, comprehensive. I want to use that word precisely. Comp complex is not the word to use. Uh, but perhaps the biggest transformation in aviation occurred in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, and that is the addition of glass cockpit technology, GPS, and that changed everything. Um, and I'm not so sure it changed it for the better because a aviation now has become much more expensive uh, for the average person to get involved in aviation. And kudos to the FAA for creating the sport pilot regulations that allows a pilot now to get a, a person to become licensed uh, with as little as 20 hours uh, of total flight time. But in reality, it's, 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 it's a little more than that. Uh, so aviation has changed that way. And uh, the, the, complex, the uh, comprehensive nature of it, um, you know, has good and bad points. But ultimately, I focus on one thing, and that is how uh, easy is it for the average person to enter aviation? And um, it has not become easier for them, not at all. It's much more expensive. You have many more hoops to jump through, um, much more comprehensive information to absorb and acquire. And that, uh, I think, is a, a detriment to aviation. And um, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but if airplanes don't uh, become less expensive, in other words, perhaps Mosaic, mm -hmm. the new Mosaic anticipated rules will make... Uh, 
uh, airplanes less expensive, uh, like light sport aircraft or the aircraft that fit into the, let's say, uh, light sport category. Um, but yet those are older aircraft, uh, like the 150s uh, that you know don't fit into the light sport category or some of the um, uh, different aircraft that uh, should, and if that happens, that's good, but those are still older aircraft. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to have newer aircraft. And these aircraft start costing, you know, 150,000, 200,000, or what your average uh, Cirrus aircraft costs today. Uh, it's just, I, I don't see how people can afford to fly. And just one last aspect of that, the average person today goes out, takes a flight trip, takes one lesson, 1.5 hours or so in a Cirrus, and they come back, flight instructor and uh, airplane rental, $400. Mm -hmm. How, how does anybody afford that? And, and let me just say one last thing about this. And, and this is the most amazing part. My most favorite airplane in the world to fly is the Piper Cup. Right. But, but the most unique airplane, and my, I would say my second most favorite airplane, is the Air Coupe, invented by Fred Wick back in the 1940s. And the air coupe is unique because it has um, rudder and ailerons that are interconnected. Right. So you don't need to use rudder pedals. You basically fly the airplane, land it in a crab. As long as you touch down on the main gear with the nose gear above the runway, the airplane spring gear will align the airplane with the ground track. Here's the amazing thing about the air coupe. And uh, I'll give it to you as a quote from Wolfgang Langevisha in his book, Stick and Rudder. Langevisha said that in 1942, he said, uh, that in 10 years from 1942, thus 1952, mm -hmm. airplanes will no longer have rudder pedals. In other words, a pilot will no longer have to manipulate rudders. Rudders, And the reason he said that was because he saw Fred Wick's air coupe and realized what an amazing design it was. Uh, well, it turns out that didn't happen mm -hmm. uh, because of the, of the plethora of available airplanes after World War II uh, made it easy for everybody to buy, uh, you know, an airplane with uh, ailerons and rudders, separate uh, connections there. And the air coupe never took off. But let me tell you about the air coupe and why it was unique. Had the air coupe became the airplane to purchase, uh, and, and and thus it was continued, uh, it, it continued in manufacturing. Fred Wick says that in his students who flew the air coupe, the average solo time was 4.6 hours, 4.6 hours. Unbeknown to me, without ever having read Fred Wick's book from the ground up and thus learning his solo time was 4.6 hours. I soloed someone in an air group at uh, John Wayne airport in 4.7 hours, 4.7 hours. And that was a tower controlled airport, hmm. by the way, at the time. And I, I thought, how's this guy learning to fly this airplane so fast? It, it's just, it, it, you know, it wasn't my superior instructional skill, although I didn't discount that. Uh, and uh, it was because the airplane is the easiest airplane in the world to fly. Had we had that airplane today, the average person could go out on the weekend solo and uh, and then two weeks later have a private pilot certificate. The most difficult part for them would be getting a uh, 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 passing the knowledge exam. Right. And, uh, so anyway, uh, that is why I was excited about the air coupe. And I, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not, I try to remain optimistic that aviation will still be affordable uh, for people, but uh, sometimes it's a little hard to remain super optimistic about that. Yeah, I do, I do agree. The, the cost of aviation definitely keeps a fair amount of people out of the industry, at least to learn to fly. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's troubling from, from that standpoint. But um, so I, I know one of the things that you helped me with, uh, and that is when I was first, I, I, I wrote a book, uh, Pilot Weather from Solo the Airlines, and I was looking to push it out as an ebook. And I know you spent uh, your generous time with me to be able to give me your two cents on how to do that successfully. Yeah, my pleasure. And um, one of the things I have run into, I mean, you have, online programs as well as books that you sell. Um, one of the hardest things for me to, to deal with over the last 25 years I've been doing online kind of content is keeping it up to date. Um, so mm -hmm. how do you deal with the fact that you might have created something you know, many, many years ago and while 
a lot of the things remain the same. There are changes that come along to yes. uh, you have to deal with. How do you deal with that? All right. It's uh, Scott, 20 percent of my time is uh, uh, every day is dealt with updating my material. You know, I have like what uh, eight books uh, that I've, I've written. 12 e-courses and so when the fa changes something there's a lot of, and then audiobooks to go with that it's a lot of work yeah. and um, uh, so that's part of the commitment that i made so my materials all updated all current and you, there's just no other answer than uh to do it and i could hire somebody to do that but uh, i'm a one-man show right. i just do everything myself for one very important reason it's the only way to make sure i get it done mm -hmm. correctly mm -hmm. um so uh, that's that's the way I am, and um, it'd be nice one day if the FA, FA stops changing things, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. Um, yeah. So uh, it is a real, real challenge, and all I can say is just it's just you make time and you just do it. Yeah, I, I, I run into the same thing. I know the Aviation Weather Center updated their website recently, back in October. Oh gosh, yes. And so yes. You, know, you have screenshots and you have links to various things that are broken now and. Unfortunately, yeah. you just got to take the time and energy to, uh, to to do that. And in some cases, I've just given up and I've I've taken old old programs and just said, OK, forget that and develop something new based on some of the basic principles of that particular workshop or whatever it was. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes that's what you have to do. You just have to rebuild the entire program. I did that with uh, my uh, IFR flight planning module in my e-course uh, because it was originally built just based on using the uh, uh, typical weather portals that you would find at the Aviation Weather Center even before that. And so uh, I built it all based on floor flight and uh, that because that's what people use nowadays. And then, of course, as you say, when the Aviation Weather uh, uh, Channel changed their formatting, I had to go through the private pilot in, in uh, course. But you know, I figure that's part of the, that's part of the deal. And uh, fortunately, though, sometimes you know it's not necessarily the uh, I, the the, uh, uh, the 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 content doesn't change. The structure of how the content is presented changes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can get away with not having to you know update a picture uh, because the content is is still the same despite the fact the picture has changed. But you can only do that for so many iterations of change. Anyway, it is what it is. It is what it is, unfortunately. Um, so if you had somebody watching this program that hasn't yet quite yet decided to bite the bullet and put the money up and, and do, the, uh, do the dirty deed of learning to fly, uh, what would you <clears throat> recommend to them? <clears throat> well, uh, <clears throat> I think that the most important thing to do in, in terms of learning to fly, and if you wanted to uh, increase the chance of being successful at learning to fly, I don't know of any single more important thing than finding a good flight instructor. It just, it's, it, it just, nothing else matters more than that. And uh, unfortunately, like, uh, you know, lawyers, doctors, engineers, Professional people, unprofessional people, car technicians, you know, not everybody is the best at their profession. And so you have to find somebody who's good for you. And to find that or to do that, you follow the principles. In an article I wrote on my blog, which you can go to rodmachado.com, click the blog uh, tab, and uh, look for the article that says how to find a good flight instructor. Type it in the search bar and, and read it. And that's what you do. Uh, that's important. Second thing is, I used to recommend people pursue a private pilot certificate, um, and nowadays it might be best to uh, pursue a sport pilot certificate first, just to get the rating uh, and at a reduced cost, which you can do if you have a good flight instructor, and, and and that's the key. But you can get it at a reduced cost, and then go on to get the private pilot certificate. It's a whole lot easier getting a private pilot certificate if you already have a, a, a sport pilot certificate. So uh, for obvious reasons, because you're a rated pilot already. So you learn a little bit extra, and then you can add on the private pilot certificate. I, that would be the best advice I would give uh, somebody. And then you know, uh, if you really want good material and 
uh, I don't want to sound like the kamikaze pilot who has to do all this bragging ahead of time, but I would say this, uh, buy my private commercial pilot handbook and read it. And I also have a book called How to Fly an Airplane. It's everything I've learned over 53 years of flying airplanes on stick and rudder flying and the basic principles of flying. You read that book, you read the How to Fly an Airplane handbook, and then you go down and take the FA knowledge exam and uh, be, in, in, because it's a self-study course. So you can just show up and say, here's my self-study course. I want to take the exam. You don't need an endorsement. Uh, and, and so consequently, uh, you're good to go. And that's what I would recommend. <laughs> well, sounds good. Well, that's a good way to end this program. So uh, I put up on the description section in the video that will be released shortly, uh, Rod, uh, Rod's uh, website and his contact information. And like I said, I, I have all his books as well. So uh, they're definitely worth the investment uh, of money and time to go through and read them all. Uh, Rod, you are a true gentleman, uh, generous of your time. I really appreciate your, your time and energy and all the, uh, the things that you've done for aviation. Thank you, Scott, and back at you, my friend. I could say the same thing about you. I think I did, <laughs> and I mean it. Thanks.